Good afternoon and welcome back to Question Time at City University of London. I'm Sam Liebus. Let's introduce you to our panel. We're still joined by Ross Kempsell um, on my left, who's the political editor of Talk Radio, which broadcasts to more than 300,000 listeners a week. He has previously worked as chief reporter for the political blog Guido Forks. We're also joined by Amira Gabarin. Uh, she's of Palestinian heritage and has a strong interest in Middle Eastern politics. She's also travelled in the, in the region and writes for This Week in Palestine. We're also joined by Lorraine Ray Millet, who's passionate about Western cinematic portrayals of women's status and conflicts testimony in Hispanic cinema. She's also interested in the rise of European populism and the so-called French Macronism. And last but not least, we're joined by Clara Freeman, who's interested in European politics and terrorism. She previously worked for several French broadcasters and notably covered the Nice attacks in 2016. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, get straight, let's get straight into it with our first question from Beth Higginson in the audience. Uh, yeah, uh, what difference will it make, if any, for Theresa May to step down? Yeah, so this comes after Theresa May revealed last night to the 1922 committee that she'd stand down before the next phase of the Brexit process, if her deal was passed. Last night, Boris Johnson said he would now support her deal in Parliament. However, there's no guaranteeing either way whether the deal will pass or not. It's made more challenging with the DUP still saying they wouldn't support it. Ross, does changing the singer affect the song or is this going to actually change the process? It's already changed the song and the reason for that is that within half an hour, Boris Johnson, one of the major opponents of the deal, decided to back the Prime Minister. We also saw Ian Duncan Smith, a serious opponent of the Prime Minister who privately has been doing a lot of work uh, attempting to remove the Prime Minister, backing the deal. So it has brought round, I'm told, as many as 40 Tory rebels in private. We've seen that the number of Tory rebels now is at about 57 in public. Many more will publicly declare that they will back the deal if the DUP change their position. That does not necessarily mean changing their position to back the deal. The DUP could change their position to abstain, for example. There could be a way through tomorrow on voting on the withdrawal agreement alone rather than the political declaration, which the DUP may abstain on. So there are different ways and means of making this process work and come to a conclusion. But the initial trigger has been Theresa May making this announcement, so it has changed the process. Thank you. Let's move that over to you, Amira. Do you think um, that if this is something to do with the leadership contest and anything to do with politics? or do you think Boris Johnson, for example, is just using this as a, a, a way of getting in control? Yeah, I think absolutely he is using it um, to further his own political career and I think the whole Brexit process has been completely dominated by Tories and other politicians who have wanted to um, use it for their own um, career. The Telegraph um, said that there's a 5 to 1 odds that Boris may become PM and I find that frightening because anything that's worse than Theresa May is Boris Johnson or, God forbid, maybe Jacob Rees-Mogg or one of these hard Brexiteers who do not have the country's best interests at heart, even if you did vote for Brexit. So I think, you know, the PM always said that she didn't intend to um, lead the Conservatives into the next election. So in that sense, I think it was expected. But I think um, it definitely uh, puts a spanner in the works in terms of future leadership. Do you think um, her stepping down, Lorraine, is going to do more harm than good? I mean, she still needs... Uh, regardless of the DUP support, she still needs 40 or so votes from Labour. Her, her deal was voted twice down in the Commons, once by 230 votes, which was the biggest in, in parliamentary history. Do you think it's going to make any difference her doing this? I think it's going to do more harm to Britain than anything else, because at the end of the day, we are losing a leader, we're losing the Prime Minister. We are just, British politics is just looking foolish right now. And we just had eight votes last night, which none of them had a majority. So basically we're saying to the Prime Minister, we don't like what you're doing. And we're saying to options, we don't like those options either. So what are we doing? So instead of asking the Prime Minister to, re, to step down or to do something else, absolutely majorly preposterous, like stepping down like she's doing right now, the point is to see what we're going to do with the Brexit, because the Brexit is going to happen anyway. This is, we it would be wrong to think that it's not going to happen, especially after the vote we had last night. So instead of arguing on, oh, is it good that she's stepping down? No, it's not good. She should be staying. We had a prime minister. She survived a vote of no confidence. Why would she leave then? Uh, Clara, Clara, let's come to you on that. Um, what do you think? Do you think she, uh, she, was, she made the right decision by deciding to step down? Well, I think she's just trying to put some pressure on the MPs because we know for a fact that both her deal were rejected so twice. Um, I don't think she will step down. I don't think it's a good thing because um, there's no one against her that, sh that could be able to 
like bring Brexit to 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 the UK. Uh, I certainly well, don't see Corbyn. I'm going to I'm just going to throw this back over to um, to Ross. Where it, it, is it a matter of changing person or policy? Do you think? Now it's got to the time where it's, it's become too fraught that the person itself needs to change, much like when uh, a football team loses eight games in a row, they change their manager. Yeah. All, great, all, all prime ministers face great tests in their term. Uh, every single prime minister has to deal with enormous issues. Theresa May has landed in her inbox an absolutely enormous issue, probably the defining issue of the latter half uh, of modern British politics, I think it's arguable to say. At the same time, she volunteered for the job and she ran, and she, it's her responsibility. No one else was really able to take on the job. Well, I mean, you can argue that, but at the same time, there were plenty of others who wanted to ha have a crack at it at the time, and the Prime Minister worked actually quite brutally behind the scenes in the Tory leadership race to make sure that she got this job. And you can argue very cogently that she should see it through and, and not resile from what she is doing now. I, we're gonna I, we're gonna have to move on, I'm afraid, to the next question. Thank you for that though. This comes from Natasha Devan in the audience. How can Macron justify use of domestic insurgency tactics on the streets of Paris? Yes, so this comes after Macron said he would deploy the military to dissuade violence from the weekly yellow vest protests. This Saturday the soldiers will operate under strict conditions. However, according to the military governor of Paris, if their lives or the lives of civilians are threatened, they could open fire. This is the 19th weekend of protests, but does it set a worrying precedent using your own military against your own people, Lorraine? I think this is the action of a despot. You should not use your military against your people. Then I'm aware, obviously, that the military is going to be used to protect the monument and all buildings, but knowing that the police forces, which is 60,000 people, 60,000 police officers, again, 45 civilians, only a third of them are trained for policing, crowded environment, lack of protest, and you already have 17,100 civilians being hurt, 17 of them losing an eye, five, five of them losing a hand. If the police forces are not able to handle the civilians, how will the military even? Clara, I sense you're going to disagree well, with this. He totally can, because we've all been witnessing what has been happening in Paris and all over the country as well. It's just got out of hand, and we just need the military to be there to protect monuments. Um, if we look back in December, uh, what happened at the Arc de Triomphe, uh, the yellow vests completely ransacked the place, and it's going to cost up to 1 million euros to the country to repair this. So we can't just let this happen and just watch the whole capital burn down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick, pick up on a uh, point that Clara just made, if I may. Last, uh, last weekend, 120 arrests were made, and it's estimated that it's going to cost over 200 million euros in damages, the whole uh, duration of these yellow vest protests. Does Macron have no choice but to deploy the military, Ross? I have some experience of French uh, riot policing because I covered the Euro 2016 football tournaments in France and was uh, covering many uh, riots where English football fans were involved and the tactics are brutal. The policing culture is different to the policing culture in the UK. We've seen that as well uh, in the Catalan independence, uh, the way that that was dealt with by the Spanish government. We've seen recently in Europe and even putting back to the, the Greek, Greek crisis protests, uh, the, the development of a, of a heavy handed policing in Europe, which we do not want to see Im imported into the UK. Uh, so my view would be that uh, Macron is definitely overstepping the mark. At the same time, it is clear that there is no solution to having hundreds of thousands of demonstrators uh, blockading your capital city every weekend. So there needs to be a political change. Yes, uh, I'm, Listening I'm to gonna, them. Guys, I'm going to have to throw over to Amira. Um, do you think that he has no choice? Back to deploy the military. Well, you know, it's a difficult one because obviously, you know, we're in a liberal society and we believe that everyone should have the right to protest, and I'm a big believer in that. But I think, you know, once it becomes violent, once you're destroying and burning down businesses and historical monuments and people are getting really hurt, what is the other viable solution? I mean, it's easy to criticize. And if the protest hadn't gone this far for over 19 weeks, that would be one thing. But 19 weeks later, when parts of France are actually becoming destroyed, and it doesn't seem like these people will take any justifiable, uh, sorry, solution to it, I don't really see what alternative he has. We're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid we're gonna have to, uh, we're going to have to leave that debate there for the time being. You can carry that on, on the hashtag CityNewsQT on Twitter. Let's go to our final question from the audience, and that's from Sophie Royal. Hi there. Should parents or parliament have the final say on how children receive their sexual education? So this comes after MPs voted in favour of the government's new LGBT inclusive regulations in school. 
Uh, the plan states pupils in primary school will receive relationships education, while secondary school students will learn about relationships and sex education. However, parents in Birmingham have recently been protesting against the inclusion of LGBT inclusive classes, stating it disagrees with their religious conservative background. Um, Amira, whose choice should it be? Well, I think, you know, we pick and choose um, with this argument. It's always depending on what views support ours. We live in a society where we say res we respect other people's religions and the right to raise their children with certain morals and beliefs, but then we don't respect their right to allow their children to maybe not take part in uh, education classes that go against their fundamental beliefs. And I think if you take the example in Birmingham recently, you know, 600 students were withdrawn from that school, 98% of those were Muslim. So when you're in a community, it is very important to acknowledge the religion and the morals and the upbringing of these children. And if their parents believe that it isn't, it's not compatible, I think, you know, in a liberal society, you have to respect that and you have to let the parents decide, like we would the other way around. Um, let's throw that over to Lauren. Do you think it's a question of cultural relativism? No, I don't believe that the parents should have the last say into it because if you actually have a look at the number, you've got 56% of kids in Birmingham schools who use a homosexual term as an insult or who heard a homosexual term as an insult. So, I mean, letting your kid being in this kind of environment, it means that you're completely unaware that you're letting this happening and that you're letting your kid hearing that and being influenced by, by it. The fact that you have 45% of LGBT trans uh, and, and, um, and bi people that experience as well um, insults and harassment in school just as a kid, it's mm. almost half it's like it's half of my classroom in my MA would be harassed because they're gay. Let's um, throw that over to you, Clara. Uh, a bisexual woman who was a practicing Muslim, or is a practicing Muslim, spoke to the ITV yesterday and said that she was told she didn't deserve to, be, to exist when she came out. Do you think fundamentally that education needs to change so that y more young people are aware? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that those classes are a way to maybe change um, the mindset of uh, our young people. Um, if we let parents uh, remove the children from those classes, then we'll just end up with some people being ignorant about this subject and some people knowing about this. And trust me, ignorance just only builds up hatred and just ignorance just, just uh, drives people apart. And that's not what we want for UK now. And Scotland has implemented those classes last November, so why not England? Um, let's final thoughts from you, Ross. Is it parents or parliament? Let's get the, the final say. I don't trust MPs any more than I would trust bad parents to make decisions. So I do not think that the answer to everything is to put things in the hands of MPs. I also think that there is another question, which is who pays for this? So I'm not happy, for example, to pay tax uh, that fund state schools where children are taught things uh, that I don't uh, uh, think are acceptable about uh, but then homosexuality. Every subject, if you if you're not a fan of history, be like, oh, I don't want my kids to be learning but about this. this. Is not a fundamental I, no, I no, I agree, and I'm not happy either for to pay for children to be taught, for example, anti-scientific uh, ideas in school or ideas that uh, LGBT rights are somehow wrong. I, I'm not happy to pay for that personally, but uh, if people want to do that, then there needs to be a broader debate about where that takes place and the regulation of independent schools. I think in the case that we were talking about, these are state schools and have been, and uh, it's not something that I'm content to fund, that kind, of, that kind of teaching. Well, thank you. We're going to have to leave it there for the show. That's all we've got time for today. But thanks for joining us for this special edition of Question Time. Special thanks to our guest again, Ross Kempsell, and all the panellists and our audience in the studio and at home. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>